For the paradigm that I'm dealing with today, the problem of equivalence would be resolved as follows. The problem, you know, the uncertainty principle. Equivalence is, is taken as meaning the same function, usually. Funktionskonstanz, okay. same function in Germany. But if you think about it, a translation is never written for exactly the same reader or public as the source text. It's always a new text in a new context for a new reader, usually for a new client, done in, often in a new culture. So, so how could there possibly be the same function? In fact, by definition, the general rule should be for translations to be new text that carry out new functions. And, and the situations where we have the same function would therefore become a special case. And in this paradigm, equivalence is thus reduced to a special case scenario, whereas the general rule for translations would be that the translation has a new function for a new client on the target site. Equivalence is made very small, special case. Problem solved, new paradigm, new way of thinking. This paradigm shift is actually fairly easily dated. Uh, two books, both written or both published in 1984. The first uh, is in German, Grundlegung einer allgemeinen Translationstheorie, uh, Foundations for a General Theory of Translating and Interpreting by Katharina Reis and Hans Vermeer. Uh, in this book, you can actually see something of the paradigm shift because Katharina Reis uh, worked and works still very much within the equivalence paradigm. Uh, her main work is on text genres, text types. Her, her idea is that uh, certain types of text have to be uh, translated so as to maintain equivalence on certain level. Within that same book, we see Hans Vermeer actually developing the new paradigm. The second book is by a, a German woman who, whose career uh, was, is in Finland, Justa Holzmenteri, Translatorisches Handeln. Uh, translatory, translatory means of the translator. Yeah? Translatory action or translator's actions, if you like, theories and methods, uh, published in Helsinki. And, and this is where you get uh, the translation, well, being connected with action theory. And uh, the whole set of relationships with uh, clients especially becomes very important for Holtzman today. Uh, that's a double point of departure. They're not the same, but they are very compatible. Uh, with respect to the main concepts that come out. And I'll just deal with the main concepts at this stage. The first, and perhaps easiest to remember, is what's called the Skopos rule. The dominant factor in a translation, and here they mean a translation project, everything that a translator is doing, is its purpose. And the word for purpose here is Skopos, just a Greek word which means the aim of what you, of an action, purpose. Purpose is good enough for me in English. Uh, this means that whereas in the equivalence paradigm the dominant factor is the source text, you analyze the source text, you become aware of the functions of the source text in order to reproduce them somehow. Here the entire focus has shifted towards something that is in the act of translating itself. As Vermeer says in a later text, the source text is dethroned. It was king, now it is no longer. What's king? Skopos, the purpose that the translator has. And that purpose is only exceptionally the same as the purpose carried out by the source text. This simple Skopos rule implies that the same text can be translated in different ways for different purposes. 
Same text, many different translations. And the translations can all be equally correct and useful. We might think of the Bible, why not, which can be translated for children. The Bible, which can be translated for uh, people who want uh, it to be read easily. We could have the Bible translated philologically for people who want to, to come closer to the original languages and understand what's happening there, and so on. The same text can be translated in many different ways for many different purposes. So what do we have to study? The purposes. They will then give us the strategies that the translator should use. According to this perspective, all strategies, that is the things that in the equivalence paradigm, you know, we met uh, different ways of translating formal dynamic equivalence, etc. All strategies are legitimate if they achieve the corresponding purpose. Thereby, the translator is transformed from someone who merely produces equivalence into someone who is an expert in the production of new texts for new purposes. The role of the translator becomes much more active, much richer, much more interesting. And, and an important part of this expert action is that it's based on information that comes partly from the source text, but also partly from a client, Arbeitsgeber, a person who gives the job, who gives the work, a person who pays the money. And uh, that person also gives instructions of some kind. Uh, and the term we've been using in English for this is brief. Uh, a lawyer would give uh, a brief, uh, no, a client would give a lawyer a brief, general instructions about what the lawyer has to achieve. Uh, and the actual details of it are left to the expert, that is, the lawyer. Uh, Femer himself uh, prefers the term commission. Uh, we might think of a client giving a commission to a painter. Paint me a painting, I want it this big, um, I'm going to pay you so much money, but you're the artist, you do the rest. Okay, and the term in German, Auftrag. There was lots of debate about that, about uh, how active a client is, how active a translator should be, uh, but most would agree that this is a dynamic relationship that has to be negotiated, and that it is part of what we should be studying. Not just the source text and the translator, but the source text, the brief, therefore the purpose, and then what the translator does. That's it. That's, that's the, equi the, the, the paradigm that, that I'm calling here purpose and action, or the paradigm that others call the scopos theory. It developed within the German language and was um, very slow to develop beyond German. It was translated fairly late in the game. If we go back, remember with the equivalence, I mentioned Werner Kohler, who had a very developed theory of equivalence. His theory of equivalence was related to text types, or the theory of equivalence, I wouldn't say his, because many other people were doing this related to text types by Katharina Reis, as I just mentioned. Other people in the game uh, include uh, Christiana Nort, who, who uh, in her first book, related these functionalist ideas about achieving purposes to the need to analyze source texts uh, very, uh, very fully in order to uh, develop translation strategies. And, and that focus on the source text is still there in, in Reis and still in Nort, both of whom are very close to translator training situations. Holtzmentary is then a more radical break in saying, no, we're going to look at what the translator actually does, at that action, we're going to study the translator's role as an expert and the translator's role uh, relations with the other people around them. And then Vermeer, at the same time, comes in and declares, as we've seen, the dominance of purpose. And that would be, I think, in broad terms, the birth of the new paradigm. <laughs>